Hi, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new, I'm Olivia, and I'm so happy to have you here, but I do want to warn you that this story is very upsetting. It's very graphic. I'm going to be talking about really horrific stuff that happened to people, and some of the victims are children, so know that before I get into the sword story of the trash bag killer. On July 1st, 1977, two men walked into the Riverside, California Sheriff's Department. One pointed out a wanted poster on the wall and said, we're them. That ended the 15-year reign of terror of Patrick Wayne Kearney, possibly one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. Though he wasn't just a serial killer, he was also a rapist, a cannibal, a pedophile, and a necrophile. It seems like there were so many infamous serial killers active in the 60s and 70s on the West Coast, and Kearney was no different. He was active between 1962 and 1977 in California, where he preyed on young men, and his confirmed number of victims is 21, but it's believed it could be as high as 43. Born in Los Angeles, California, Kearney was the youngest of three sons and had a relatively stable family life. However, he was thin and sickly as a child and described as effeminate as a teenager, so he received a lot of bullying in school. His family moved around several times during his youth, but wherever he went, the bullying continued. So by the time he was a teenager, he had become withdrawn and began to fantasize about killing people. At age 13, his father, who was a cop, taught him how to slaughter pigs by shooting them in the back of the head, behind the left ear, to minimize blood spatter. Patrick got so good at it, he would slaughter them unsupervised. And he derived such pleasure from it, he didn't stop with pigs who were meant to be killed. And eventually moved on to different animals, killing for fun. Kearney ended up at a community college in California and reportedly had an IQ of 180 and was gifted with languages, particularly Spanish, but he dropped out after only a year. From there, he would join the U.S. Air Force, where he would be stationed in Texas in 1959. This is where he would meet David Hill, who would eventually become Kearney's lover. They were opposites. Where Kearney was shy and had a slight build at only five foot five, Hill was outgoing and tall, standing at six foot two. They had to hide their relationship, though, because at the time, being gay was so stigmatized. Both men were eventually discharged from the U.S. Air Force. Both went on to marry women, Though, unsurprisingly, those relationships weren't long-lasting and ended in divorce. Kearney got a job as an engineer for Hughes Aircraft in Culver City, California. During his personal time, he cultivated his skill picking up men. In 1962, Hill moved in with him, though their relationship was always tumultuous. They argued all the time. During these fights, Kearney would go out for long, solitary drives, where he would cruise around searching for victims. It's believed that the worse the relationship got, the more Kearney's need to kill grew. He would target young male hitchhikers or young men from gay bars. Kearney mostly sought out partners in San Diego or Tijuana, Mexico, where he used his fluency in Spanish as a basis to connect with potential victims. In 1962, Hill left California. That's when Kearney claimed to have killed his first victim, a hitchhiker he picked up. The victim's name is unknown, but he was confirmed to be age 19 and white. Kearney had convinced him to take a ride on his motorcycle. He drove to a secluded area where Kearney shot the man behind the ear, just like the pigs he had used to slaughter. He then sexually assaulted the body. However, he realized he had made a mistake. He had left a witness who saw them ride off together. The hitchhiker's younger cousin, so Kearney went back, picked him up, drove him to the same secluded area, and killed him too. It's not known if either of their bodies have ever been found, but Kearney confessed to both murders, along with another in 1962. A hitchhiker named Mike, who he picked up, shot, and sexually assaulted his body. And shortly after killing Mike, Hill returned home and the killing stopped at least for a while. The first murder Kearney confessed to and was convicted of occurred in 1967 down in Tijuana, where he and Hill were visiting a friend. Identification of the victim is impossible, so he's known only as George. Kearney shot him in the head while he was sleeping and then raped him. 
He then took George into his bathroom where he sodomized the body as it lay in the bathtub and afterwards proceeded to dismember it and skin it with an exacto knife. Afterwards, Kearney extracted the bullet from the victim's head to ensure that it would not be traced to his gun. Then he buried the dismembered body behind his garage. Kearney didn't kill for years after this murder, primarily because he feared law enforcement would inquire about George. During this time, him and Hill moved to Redondo Beach, California, where they would stay for the next 10 years before turning themselves in. But that fear didn't last forever, and in 1971, Kearney began killing again. Though most of Kearney's victims were young men, some of them were really young, and he was no less cruel to them. On June 21st, 1971, he offered 13-year-old Johnny Dimchik a ride home, but instead he shot him in the car, though that didn't immediately kill him. Kearney took his body to a remote area and raped him as he bled to death. John's body was discovered 20 months later. As time passed, Kearney refined his method, becoming more efficient at his crimes. Even at the height of his killings, he went largely unnoticed. A grocery store owner did note that he bought a lot of butcher knives, but other than being a bit eerie, that's not cause for concern. And at Hughes Aircraft, he was called a model worker, which goes to show you really never know anyone. What's strange is that despite his slight build, he preferred victims who were of greater stature than himself. It's been suggested that they were substitutes for the people who used to bully him in his youth. He would go on to say that killing excited him and gave him a feeling of dominance. He designed a system of subduing his victims that was unlikely to fail or to place him in physical harm, since if one of the victims had escaped, it was unlikely that Kearney would have been able to physically overcome him. All of the victims were male, all of them were found nude, and all had been shot in the head. While driving, he would keep one hand on the wheel and use his other to shoot the victim. He did this to minimize the chance of an altercation. To avoid exhibiting any unusual behavior to potential witnesses, he would monitor the speed limit closely. After murdering his victims, Kearney would leave the bodies slumped upright in the passenger seat and drive to a secluded area. His method was to kill them quickly to avoid an altercation, which meant he didn't often torture his victims, so everything done to them was done after they were dead. He would take the bodies to a secluded place where he could engage in acts of necrophilia, then take them home, where they would be sodomized with exacto knives. They were then mutilated and dismembered with a hacksaw. He would later say he experimented with his victims' bodies out of curiosity. Occasionally, Kearney would even beat his victims after they were dead. He did this to get out some of his anger and gain a sense of power over them. He would sometimes drain the victim's blood to eliminate odor, or would bathe the body parts prior to disposal to minimize the presence of dried blood and eliminate fingerprint evidence. Kearney disposed of some of the bodies in the desert or near highways. That's why he's sometimes referred to as the Freeway Killer. The problem with that name is it's shared with two other serial killers, William Bonin and Randy Kraft. All three were active in overlapping times, had similar victims, and all left their victims on the side of highways, which made it hard for police to discern between the killers. They initially thought it was all the work of one serial killer. But Kearney had another name, the Trash Bag Killer. That's because many of his victims were dismembered and stuffed into heavy-duty trash bags. Most of the victims were part of an investigation called the Trash Bag Murders that stretched across five counties. Kearney's youngest victim was Ronald Dean Smith, who was just five years old when he disappeared from Lenox, California on August 24, 1974. His body was found in Riverside County on October 12, 1974. The autopsy revealed that unlike the older victims, he was kept alive for two days after his disappearance, and he was tortured before being strangled. Kearney began killing with a greater frequency starting in 1976. He killed on an almost monthly basis, but not all of his victims were found. On June 16, 1976, 13-year-old Michael Craig McGee disappeared. Kearney claimed to have picked up McGee while he was hitchhiking. Kearney also said that, quote, I disposed of the body, you aren't going to find him, 
and whatever that meant, it was true. McGee's body has never been found. Merle Hondo Chance was eight years old when he vanished from Venice, California on April 6, 1977, while supposedly riding his bicycle near Kearney's place of work. Kearney claimed to have smothered the boy, taken his body home overnight, and later disposed of the remains, which were discovered on May 26, 1977. Merle Chance was Kearney's last known victim, but he was not the victim who led to Kearney's arrest. That was John Otis LeMay, who was 17 when Kearney killed him on March 13, 1977. That same day at approximately 5.30 p.m., LeMay had told the neighbor that he was going to meet a man named Dave in Redondo Beach, who he had met at a local gym. Dave was David Hill, who had given LeMay Kearney's home address, but when LeMay arrived, Hill wasn't there. It was just Kearney, and he was let in, but Kearney couldn't resist the urge to kill, so he shot him in the back of the head. Kearney later dismembered the corpse and dumped the remains in the desert. They were later found on March 18, 1977. Police had actually been to Kearney's home for the LeMay investigation prior to Chance's kidnapping and murder. The police soon discovered that LeMay had been seen in the company of Kearney and Hill. When police visited the couple, they were invited in and allowed to take samples from the carpet to compare to blue fibers found on LeMay's body. When those matched, police returned and asked the two men for samples of their pubic hair as well as a sample of their dog's hair. And although Kearney was reluctant, he did give the samples. Weeks later, the results of the test on the pubic hair and dog hair taken from Kearney's home match those found on the maze body and the trash bags he was dumped in. A detective called Kearney to inform him that he had a warrant and would be returning to do a more thorough search. Kearney resigned from his job and together with Hill fled to El Paso, Texas. When their abandoned house was searched, one of the most important discoveries that was made was a hacksaw that still had the dried blood and flesh of John LeMay on it. Luminol showed traces of blood in the bathroom and other parts of the house. A further search of Kearney's office at Hughes Aircraft revealed where Kearney had acquired his industrial strength trash bags. All this was enough for a nationwide bulletin to be put out for the pair, who eventually turned themselves in on July 1st, 1977, when they walked into that police station. It was actually the pair's family who had convinced them to turn themselves in. David Hill was eventually cleared from all involvement with the crimes and released, likely because Kearney made a full confession, admitting to killing 28 victims initially, but then added on seven more. In order to avoid the death penalty, he agreed to plead guilty. Kearney was charged with 21 counts of murder. He wasn't charged for the other seven because of lack of physical evidence, though the police are certain he is responsible. He received 21 life sentences and is currently serving those out at California State Prison, Mule Creek. And that is the unsettling story of the trash bag killer. And if you'd like to hear more stories like that, please subscribe.